uh, about this uh, topic. We have Mr. Judith uh, Richter, uh, Mr. David Miller, and uh, Mr. David Klemper. Uh, the introduction remarks will be given by uh, Alessia Abigui. And I have the pleasure to give the floor to Lida Lotzak, who will moderate uh, this conference. Before giving the floor to uh, Mrs. Lotzak, I will ask you to sign our golden book. <laughs> and we also have a little present from the Swiss Press Club, the books Platinum Copies 2018 were just published. Which is a compilation of cartoons. You might find some about her. So why don't Alessia, if you want to give, we start you and Mrs. Uh, Lotzak will. So, uh, Lida, you have the floor. You just need to press on the button in front of you to take the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the lovely introduction. And I would like to also, in the name of the, the entire panel here, to uh, welcome you all in, uh, in this press conference. Uh, I will be moderating the meeting, which means basically I will be trying to make speakers to stick to their 15 minutes. I hope they are hearing me well. And then I will be very happy to take uh, questions from the floor. We agreed that the best way to proceed would be perhaps that after each presentation, there will be a moment for clarification, for questions uh, from you, which will be sort of to the point asking only about uh, issues that may not have been clear. And then when all three presenters will have finished their presentations, then we can open for a much wider discussion and comments coming from you. So without any further delay, I would like to invite my colleague Alessia Bigi to uh, give you a small introduction on behalf of the organizer, the Geneva Infant Feeding Association. Thank you, Lida. <laughs> so um, the Geneva Infant Feeding Association is the liaison office of a bigger network, which is called International Baby Food Action Network, IPFAN. Um, IPFAN over 20 years has been increasingly as, uh, aware and concerned about the risks that conflicts of interest represent in uh, policy making in the public interest. And we organized this press conference today right before the 71st session of the World Health Assembly because two important documents will be discussed there. And one is the framework of engagement with non-state actors. The other one is a tool called safeguarding against possible conflicts of interest in nutrition programs. And the general program of work of WHO for 2019 and 2000, uh, until 2023 will be adopted. Uh, we'll demonstrate today that even though conflict of interest has been mentioned in several official documents at WHO level, uh, this doesn't mean that it, uh, this has led to concrete action and that our policy spaces are adequately protected and that public interest prevails over business interest. Uh, in order to do that, we invited three e experts coming from different backgrounds, but whose work uh, in com within conflicts of interest is interlinked. The speakers today will be uh, Dr. Judith Richter, who is a senior researcher for civic engagement and whose numerous publications include Holding Corporations Accountable, Corporate Conduct, International Codes, and Citizen Action, and public-private partnerships and international health policy making. How can public interest be safeguarded? Professor David Miller, uh, who has written widely on issues on, of communication and power, including the lobby on the lobby strategies of the alcohol and food, food industries. Most recently, he co-authored Impact of Market Forces on Addictive Substances and Behaviors, the Web of Influence of Addictive Industries. Professor David Klemperer, who has long contributed to awareness raising on conflicts of interest issues in the medical community, who is co-editor of the book Conflicts of Interest in Medicine, 
an expert on the Committee of for Transparency and Independence of the German Medical Association and a member of Physicians No Free Lunch Initiatives. Uh, we hope that after the presentation of our speakers today, um, the press, member states, our colleagues from the non-governmental non organizations, as well as the general public, will reflect on the debates uh, in the upcoming World Health Assembly. I will give now the floor to our speakers, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Alessia, very much. Uh, I want to uh, say that uh, Apart from people in this room, uh, we are hopefully also followed by people outside, not only outside of this room here in Geneva, but uh, elsewhere in the world. Uh, invitations were sent wide to various networks, uh, also to uh, members of the delegations for the World Health Assembly. And uh, we are hoping that uh, this is what is going to be said here is going to be also heard by those who will be attending the assembly and cannot be in person with us. So let me extend our welcome also to those who may be watching us right now. And with that, I would like to give the floor to the first speaker, Judith Richter. Thank you, Lida. Um, well, whoever knows me knows that I always have to struggle to come to condense what I'd like to say. So I start very quickly so that I try to be able to really cover the complex question about conflicts of interest in global health and nutrition governance. And maybe already to start with, we are using the word governance all the time. But I think most people don't actually know what is meant by it, and there are so many definitions. So I would like to say for me, the one definition which I usually use is rule setting, formal and informal. And I like to have the image which the Greeks had. It comes from kibernan, it comes from steering in French. Go gouvernance, le gouvernail is the rudder of a ship. So when we talk about governance in health and nutrition, it means what directions are our politics taking right now? Who is at the rudder? Uh, are we still having the right direction? And uh, also I would like to say, well, I'm usually giving presentations and give lots of uh, details from documents, but I would like to talk about the politics of conflicts of interest because I think the problem is not that there is not knowledge. There will need to be some more discussion about how to go about conflicts of interest policies and maybe, um, yes, to uh, still work on policies that are adequate for the current situation, but I think the biggest obstacle is really political rather than theoretical. We are in a context which has very much changed since the 1980s. And uh, literature usually talks about globalization, but people who want to be more precise say it's part of neoliberal global restructuring. There has been a plan behind it or a framework of thought. And within the UN, it means that since 1992, since the Rio Conference on the Environment and Sustainable Development, UN agency leaders have actively promoted closer UN business relationships in the name of partnership. So we have what I call a public-private partnership paradigm, a way of thinking. But at the beginning, when people analyzed and said, what is this about, they distinguished, they said many of the public-private partnerships are actually things that we already had, sponsorship, research, collaboration, and so on. But there are two new types promoted within the UN. Uh, one are the following the type which was set in the early 2000, uh, according to uh, proposals, among others, of Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which said it's very good to have concrete public-private partnerships with industry on the boards of these partnerships and with public co-funding. 
And then we have something at the time called multi-stakeholder initiatives. The model was the global compact. And the idea was all actors have to talk uh, to solve problems. The problem is that suddenly all actors were called stakeholders, and I'll come to that later. Now we find ourselves at the new stage under the sus discussions about sustainable development agenda 2030. We have now so and so many goals, and one of them is the goal number 17, and there are two concrete goals which talk about what is now called multi-stakeholder partnerships as key implementation tools of this agenda. And this World Health Assembly, the theme is aligning health with the SDGs. So, when you look at the literature, for example, Professor Rodwin, Mark Rodwin, who worked a lot on conflicts of interest in the medical industrial complex, he talked about the problem that conflicts of interest, there has been something he calls a normalization. What we have observed, I have made this here very short, this part, is that when the global public-private partnerships of the type of the Global Alliance on Vaccines and Immunization, the Gavi type, came on the agenda. There was also a redirection of the direction from human rights-based health for all to something called investing in health. Dr. Brundtland was at the time the Director General, and she said she um, uh, promoted the writing of a report on macroeconomics and health. And this report, I looked now again, was co-funded by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, and Ted Turner's UN Foundation, if I'm right. But what I observed is there were actually, um, there was a mandate to work for Health for All in the 21st century, and suddenly it went, a lot of this went into public-private partnerships will be the tool to reach health for all. For a long time, conflicts of interest were actually normalized. It wasn't seen as a problem to have companies on the boards of these uh, um, entities. But this has changed. We have a lot of documents which do talk about conflicts of interest. But when you look, you have nothing behind it. It's nearly like a false alibi function. You go for some uh, interaction which people may think is not really what you think is how, how interaction should be, maybe overly close, and then a suddenly sentence about conflicts of, of interest. But there have been resolutions at WHO by the member states who ask to really address what are appropriate relationships taking conflicts of interest into account. This year we have three documents which are influential in national and international arena. One came out in 2014. It is done, was done by the so-called scaling up nutrition movement. I want to maybe remind people it was first launched at Principled Pub People's Public Private Partnership. That was the title when it was launched, and the reference note, uh, the work on it, including also training of governments on it, was Gates funded. There was some discussion, people were quite concerned, and what I'm here ha having as the third document is uh, the draft approach for the prevention and management of conflicts of interest in the policy development and implementation of nutrition programs at country level. It came out because member states were concerned about how this public-private partnership and its conflict of interest uh, conceptualization actually interfered with how they usually saw the problem. But we also have since 2016 the WHO framework for engagement with non-state actors. It's now, base, it's now used as basis for training of WHO civil servants on conflict of interest identification when they work with non-state actors. 
Um, since I talk about politics, I would like to say there are for outsiders, when you look at the website, especially now uh, on the tool, what is called tool, um, you can see a whole process how they came about. But the problem is there have been, for example, there has been a technical consultation. You have a document, the critique of what was presented is on page 4 to 10. But it didn't mean that that critique went into the development of the tool. Also, more recently, there was a, more recently was an online consultation. You can find comments by conflict of interest expert Mark Rodwin, by institutional corruption expert Jonathan Marks, by the OECD representative. They have not been taken into consideration of the tool and as a police as a person who thinks about who those who work on this tool how are they supposed to actually take for example comments of the industry on the same level as comments of conflicts of interest experts in developing a tool what was not taken into consideration since the work on FENSA started? Law Professor Ann Peters, who co-edited a book on conflicts of interest in global, public, and private governance. She said, if we want the conflict of interest concept to be really useful, it may be good to remember or to think the conflict we are dealing with is an intrapersonal conflict. It's within a human or within an institution which is entrusted to take decisions on other people's behalf. That is what is called, called fiduciary decisions. It's not referring really to the clash between actors. So we do have this type of definition to some extent in the definition of the Institute of Medicine, which when it talks about institutional conflicts of interest, it talks about the conflict between an institution's own secondary financial interest with its, what is called here, primary interest. We have to remember it's the mandate, the public mandate of an institution and public and constitutional main functions. Despite the fact that this has been brought to the attention since at least 2014-15, FENSA did maintain the definition that an institutional conflict of interest is a situation where WHO's primary interest, as reflected in its constitution, may be unduly influenced by the conflicting interest of a non-state actor. So both SUN and WHO documents blur the distinction between conflicts of interest and the risks of undue influences due to what is in the documents called vested or conflicting interest of a non-state actor. People who are not, uh, it's very difficult to see the distinction between conflict of interest identification and regulation and risk assessments from these documents. My opinion is it also diverts attention from a key conflict of interest question. Do public interest actors give opportunities for undue influences in return of so-called voluntary innovative funding? Not only innovative, but we do know that WHO only a fifth is still financed by so-called assessed contributions. It is as if our parliaments or our um, health systems were only funded to a fifth by taxes. And for the rest, it's opened up to or whoever would like to give some funding. So you, if you look at the documents, actually the documents are legitimizing problematic roles for private sector actors in their interaction typologies. When you look at the overall uh, part of FENSA, it says that it's normal to look for innovative resources, uh, that uh, private sector non-state actor, of course, can participate in all kinds of public decision-making processes. 
It also talks about implementation of WHO policies and advocacy to change behaviors. But because they put all non-state actors together, it doesn't seem to have really yet come to the public attention enough. So the question is what could be done immediately, uh, maybe to come back to this, this is already a, a conflict of interest because it says you can take all kind of innovative or funding from corporations, from venture philanthropies, from member states who may want to influence decision making in WHO and gives them the other interactions in return. That's how one could interpret the list of interactions in this, in this document. So what could one do to ensure that FENSA and the conflict of interest tool in nutrition are strengthened and do not become frameworks of undue entanglements? When you look at the draft concept, which was behind the current WHO general program of work, which will be discussed next week, it is uh, describing FENSA not as a public interest safeguard, it describes it as enabling framework for multi-stakeholder partnerships. So it might be useful while I don't know how long it will take to correct the wrong definitions and per conceptualizations in FENSA and other documents, but it may be useful if citizens, civil servants, health professionals know more or less what may be useful as latest conflict of interest definitions. And then they could refer to what is used uh, called a reasonable person perspective, use their common sense because in conflict of interest regulation, perceived conflicts of interest are taken very seriously because we know that conflicts of interest, if they are not dealt with, it costs public trust and with that a public institution is losing its legitimacy. So we, I have asked Lida Lotzka to make me some, doc, some pictures to document uh, the sayings, but for the legal definition right now, I would like to propose as a working definition that by Professor Mark Rodwin, it is there since 93, since he wrote his book on medicines, morality and the market. And he proposes as Professor Peters to use both fiduciary duties and loyalty obligations as the duties that have to be uh, observed and therefore he defines a conflict of interest as a situation where an individual has an obligation to serve a party or perform a role and it has either incentives or conflicting loyalties which encourage him or her to act in ways that breach his or her obligations. So as a picture, remember conflict of interest, conflict in the heads. It's uh, there. This is why we have conflict of interest regulation. We cannot know what happens in people's heads. So we have preventive policies where statistically we know are the greatest risks. But split loyalty is not usually seen as something problematic at the outset. One has to just look what it is about. For example, in medicine, it's very well known that a caring doctor who at the same time does research has to be supervised that he is not suddenly putting research over the well-being of the patient. In the UN arena, usually the split loyalty is between um, the UN and the overall mandate of the UN and the interest of the nation state where the civil servant or official comes from. We also have the picture of divided loyalty. People know from the Bible here, actually, it says you cannot serve two masters. We have the question right now, is the new global program of work conceptualized that there is just because so much emphasis on fundraising from companies, will it go towards the interest of the companies or is the decision making really in the interest of the peoples. We are hearing now that 
financial relations will also be dealt with in multi-stakeholder partnerships. Do I still have three minutes? Very recently, April 2018, uh, IP expert and activist James Love was, call, was told that the corporations, the pharmaceutical corporations who were in the dialogue on partnerships for the financing of NCD prevention, that he should not see them as enemies because they share the same values as WHO and our partners. People know this is just a wrong picture. In the Congo, I'm not yet, I don't know yet, know which language, it said the hand that gives is always higher than the hand that takes. In the medical community, one uses a lot the saying there is no such thing as a free lunch when you are invited by pharmaceutical companies, for example. And the Russians say only in a mouse trap the cheese is for free. And in Germany, we say kleine Geschenke erhalten die Freundschaft. We say small presents maintain the friendship. You do not need much to divert uh, decision making. So the big question is what may be given in return? Are public resources diverted into initiatives defined by others? And are we wasting public funding this way? And this is what people say, for example, about the global public-private partnerships. Are is WHO's regulatory constitutional role at risk? Where is regulation of marketing of um, infant food, but also of so-called um, big soda, big alcohol, uh, big snack going. Check it out when you see what is the program. And right now, if you look at the draft concept note, there is really the big risk that WHO is being asked to become part of a multi-stakeholder governance system and broker of multi-stakeholder partnerships. So one has to look at the strings attached. Look what can be uh, detached right now. And now I will jump, which one is not supposed to do. That's about regulation. So I just come back to the discourse, what is the reason why we have so many problems with conflicts of interest. The reason is really the framework of thinking. We talk about all stakeholders have to work together in partnerships. No difference in nature, actua nature of the actors, fiduciary mandates or power. People know some have bigger stakes to fry. So I would advocate in order to decrease the increase of conflicts of interest to replace this stakeholder partnership image with the one which is the UN and public interest actors at, as those who have to guard our interests. The French say, on n'invite pas le loup dans la bergerie. You should not invite the wolf into the sheep enclosure. And uh, I would stop here and just like uh, to leave you with this image and hope that this will give greater space to rediscuss conflicts of interest. Thank you, Judith, very much. Sorry for frowning no. at you, yeah. but I just... <laughs> I just am really trying to keep to the time we agreed. Uh, I would now, as I announced, uh, open just for a few minutes if you have questions for clarification, not comments, please. We will spare time for commenting at the end of the three presentations. Anything that wasn't clear, Thomas, please. Uh, just two questions. One is to Alessia, you said that FENSA is scheduled at the World Health Assembly itself not just uh, as part of other agenda items. Can you, can you specify how this, this will be done? 
And a question to the team, uh, those nice pictures, are they public domain? Can we immediately use them, for example, tweeting them, or do you like to re keep them in your hands for the promotion of, of what you want to say? Um, I actually have not now looked whether Fenza is on the agenda. I will um, give that question to Alessia, but I did see the report of the Director General on Fenza, and what I found very problematic is the other new tendency to say that civil servants should be less risk averse. Now, I feel it's like we say the best way, multi-stakeholder partnerships are the best way to go forward in health. It means like the best way to leave a house is you jump from the third floor. If people don't like that so much, you say, well, we have conflict of interest. It's like you have this trampoline at the end, but it's actually not there. And right now, if on top of it, you say you shouldn't be so risk averse, you say jump from the fifth floor. So I am concerned about how this type of language, which first we saw in the corporate language, has gone into the United Nations language, and I hope that civil servants and others can start correcting this and say if they are risk averse, it's because they are concerned about the health and well-being of peoples. And uh, about the uh, pictures, well, I've seen that they are here in the presentation which will be broadcast. They are, we are very happy if people take them over in their work. Just attribute them to Lida Lotzka, please. Just a short comment. Yes, uh, FENSA will be discussed in the agenda item that is related to safeguarding against possible conflicts of interest. So it will be, it's in the report and it will be for sure one of the concerns that IPFAN will raise on that occasion. Any further comments, questions, clarifications? If not, then it's my pleasure to invite David number one. <laughs> <laughs> Professor David Miller, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. So I'm uh, David Miller. I am from the University of Bath uh, in the UK, but also um, a co-director of a, a non-profit company which publishes the website Spinwatch, which um, has for some 13 or 14 years now been monitoring spin, deception, and questions of conflict of interest. And I'm going to talk to you today about some research I've recently done uh, on conflict of interest and corporate uh, lobby networks, mainly at the European Union level, but with some implications, I think, for some of the debates at the UN level. Uh, this work has been published in a book uh, this year um, with Oxford University Press, and I need to tell you what we did to compile the main data from this. Uh, this is the boring bit, but it has to be said. Essentially, what we did was we did social network analysis. That means we crunched a whole load of data from the Transparency Register, from the EU Expert Register, and from a trade association directory to find out what was the relationship or membership of corporations in lobby groups and networks, trade associations, uh, policy planning groups, uh, think tanks, etc., And we compiled that data into a database, analyzed it to produce some pictures of the networks, and then we supplemented that in order to understand what were the connections between co Corporation A, Trade Association B, and Think Tank C. We compiled a whole range of other data uh, in the public domain, and also including access to documents and freedom of information legislation to get, get at material that was not easily uh, uh, findable online. So that's the basis of the data. I can answer more questions about that later if you want. I suspect you'll not be interested. Here's a picture of all, all, all of our data. This is uh, data on four industries, the alcohol, food, gambling, and tobacco industries operating at the European level. Each node there, each dot, is a company or organization. We found that industrial actors engage in a wide range of tactics in order to influence the policy process, they form complex networks across multiple levels of governance. So at the European level, at the national level, and then up again to the international level here, as represented here in Geneva. And the, these strategies, although they're not always successful, 
are actually consciously planned. They're done by the corporations with intent. They're not accidental. It's not an accident that Corporation A or Corporation B happens to be a member of Trade Association X or Y. So this is a, a, a mapping of a conscious strategy, a set of conscious strategies. Okay, so let me just give you an example uh, coming down to the level of a particular corporation of how this works, what kinds of networks we're talking about. Here's Diageo. Uh, everyone know who Diageo are? The multinational drinks corporation, formerly known as Guinness. They have a huge range of other alcoholic products. And they uh, own uh, 17 Scottish whiskey distilleries. As you can tell from my accent, I'm from Scotland. <laughs> It's entirely irrelevant to that. <laughs> but they own 17 Scottish whisky distilleries and they, they sell many brands of uh, malt whisky, which apparently is the best. I'm not a big fan of whisky. Uh, and as a result of the 17 distilleries, they have 17 memberships, uh, sorry, uh, on, on the, uh, the Scotch Whisky Association, which is a trade association for the Scotch whisky uh, industry, which is active in the Scottish, British, European and international arenas. They're also members of a whole range of other uh, uh, trade associations. I can point out here Spirits Europe, the main spirits lobby group at the European level, but also note the World Federation of Advertisers, uh, a key lobby group, which I might mention later. The European For Forum for Responsible Drinking as well. They want us not to drink their products, apparently. <laughs> All of these groups are themselves members of the EU Alcohol and Health Forum, which is the main policy body on alcohol at the European level. It's a, a, it's a forum, it's not a European Commission body, it's a partnership governance body. Okay? So it's the body which takes decisions on alcohol policy at the European level and it's of course uh, in, in, that, in that capacity has uh, some uh, several memberships, several voices for Diageo uh, at that body. Diageo also of course funds think tanks, the Weinberg Group, the EPC, the ICAP, and of course, they also directly lobby the European Commission, along with a whole range of other trade associations, uh, which is a member of Business Europe, the biggest uh, transnational business lobby group in Brussels, AmCham EU for American companies, and the British Chamber of Commerce for British companies. We can do the same exercise uh, with uh, uh, other corporations, such as Nestle, for example, who are a member of a whole range of different uh, lobby groups and think tanks. And uh, the first column there, uh, they hire lobby firms, they're members of policy fora, and in the second column, members of a huge number of trade associations. They have many different voices uh, in European Union policy. So uh, my favourite here is the Association of Chocolate, Biscuit and Confectionery Industries of the European in, uh, Union. That's the, the best title, I think. And you'll see at the bottom there, if you can read it, the World Federation of Advertisers again. Coca-Cola, the same, a whole range of lobby groups at the top there some lobby firms, some peak business associations, AmCham is, is another one that is there again, uh, the EU platform on physical activity, diet and health at the bottom there, which is the main uh, partnership uh, governance forum for policy on nutrition, diet and, uh, uh, and health uh, at the European le level. Again, a, pol a partnership um, governance body, including the corporations in making policy, not just in lobbying for policy. And again, a whole range of trade associations, or the same with Philip Morris. Uh, Philip Morris uh, is more marginal, uh, as with many other tobacco, uh, the, with the other big tobacco companies in European policy circles because of the conscious attempt to move tobacco towards the outskirts of, uh, of policy making because of the, what, what are thought of as the unique harmfulnesses of uh, tobacco as a product. Now, so as well as having uh, multiple voices, uh, voices in uh, organizations which are admitted by the corporations, they publish their membership of such organizations. There are also other ways uh, in which corporations are active. In particular, I would point out three. Civil, they, they try and capture civil society as a means for influencing policy through astroturf groups. Uh, astroturf, you'll probably be familiar with the term, means fake grassroots groups. So that's grassroots groups which are not grassroots groups. They're set up by the corporations in order to pursue their interests. Uh, think tanks which pursue corporate interests, uh, corporate social responsibility, another key means of, of, of pursuing corporate interests by pretending that the corporations are socially responsible. Advertising, marketing and media are 
uh, firms and activities are also another key area. Second area is science capture, the funding and capture, attempted capture of science to pursue corporate interests. And thirdly, the point of all of this, policy capture. And many of the corporate voices involved in these processes are not open and are deceptive in the sense that they are hidden, the corporate role is hidden, or there is a pretense that these groups are something which they're not. So we, we found it useful in thinking about this to think about um, uh, civil society as something which is not just an open arena for uh, groups from below, from uh, for charities, for NGOs, but also an arena which can be populated by groups from above, either openly or sometimes covertly. And we use the, the concept here from uh, from Nilsson uh, and um, Co uh, Cox, uh, social movements from above and below, meaning the collective agency of dominant groups to reproduce or extend their power and hegemonic positions. Now, what we're talking about in, in, in terms of dominant groups here in this particular case is the power of the corporation to extend its power or to uh, reproduce its power uh, through action. Uh, of course, the, I, I, I mean, I've already alluded to the fact that we're also talking about civil society groups which appear to be from below, but which are, in fact, from above in the sense that they work for the corporations. Many uh, examples of these uh, groups in relation to science and civil society, the Scientific Alliance or Sense About Science in the UK, the American Council on Science and Health in the US, uh, uh, a whole range of, uh, of uh, patient groups active at the European level, uh, funded by the pharmaceutical industries, um, the Obesity Awareness and Solutions Trust, a, a fantastically named group which uh, uh, took um, co corporate funding, the European Science and Environment Forum, funded by the tobacco industry. The think tanks are central to this, not, uh, not just the, the covert groups, but, the, but, some, but sometimes think tanks have covert relationships with uh, um, policy making. This is our network of food, alcohol, gambling and tobacco industries in the different colours. You can see in the, the light blue there, the think tank central to the network uh, uh, and, uh, of, of all these co corporations and therefore key policy actors. And when you look at them in, in detail, you see that the European Policy Centre, an ostensibly independent organisation, covertly a lobbyist for big tobacco, but also for food and alcohol. The Kangaroo Group, uh, one of the key ways in which tobacco gets into the European Parliament. It's a big sponsor of the Kangaroo Group, and which members of the European Parliament itself are members. ICAP, the collective think tank for big alcohol, or uh, the European Centre for Public Affairs, a friend of Europe, again, ostensibly independent groups which foster particular corporate interests. But, but these are not, this is not necessarily uh, uh, transparent. One of the things we found was that the World Federation of Advertisers, very central uh, lobbyist here, and although it seems like from its name it, it's made up of advertisers, it's actually of course made up by the, the companies that advertise, the food uh, companies, the alcohol companies, etc. And they've set up a whole range of different think tanks and front groups <coughs> to lobby for the idea that there shouldn't be any regulation of marketing, uh, especially to children. And you can see EU pledge there, we'll come back to. Corporate social responsibility. Uh, over the period of the last decade or so, uh, most of these industries have set up res socially responsible bodies uh, in order to, to um, divert attention from the possibility of regulation of those industries and to pretend that instead they are doing uh, much needed work to reduce the harm from their products. Uh, uh, in, in all cases, when these are properly and independently reviewed, the opposite is the case. They are uh, a diversion from proper uh, regulation of, of these industries. Same is true in, in relation to science. There are a whole range of uh, seemingly independent scientific groups, ILSI, uh, UFIC, two key ones, which are really very important. And it, one of the things that they do particularly well is they contaminate the supply of expertise to European Commission uh, policy committees, so experts who uh, appear in those committees have sometimes undisclosed, but very often have conflicts of interest in the sense that they have money from these organisations, which are of course entirely or almost entirely funded by the corporations. And partnership governance is, uh, as Judith was saying, a key way in which the corporations are able to not to move beyond the traditional relationship of lobbying for government policy changes and towards simply making the policy themselves uh, in alliance with govern government. And here's the the UK uh, examples at the top there, and then the, the two EU examples at the bottom, as I've mentioned already, 
the Alcohol and Health Forum, the Platform on Diet, Physical Activity and Health. Now, these are enshrining voluntary approaches to compliance. Uh, they don't work. And what's needed if we, if we want to actually improve the health of people who consume alcohol or eat food is binding regulation as opposed to co-regulation. The revolving door is another issue which has arisen as a result of the, the, the same processes which has led to the increase in conflict of interest. Even the OECD recognises that new forms of partnership between government and the private and non-profit sectors present new challenges for policymakers and public managers. At the European Food uh, uh, Safety Agency, uh, uh, a study was done which showed that over 50% of the experts involved in their committees had conflicts of interest, i.e. corporate conflicts of interest. And conflicts of interest are, are, are real things. These are not something which is uh, about the conflict between public interest and private interest. This is a, a conflict and a question about whether, whether people who are serving a public function are, are conflicted in the sense that they have uh, mostly uh, finan other financial relationships such as employment, consultancy, stock ownership, etc. Now, in the medical journals, this is the medical journals policy, uh, this is well recognised, but it's not well recognised necessarily in, in policy forums more generally. But one result of having uh, transparency in this in the medical journals is we start to be able to make sense of some of the relationships between corporations and in particular, in this case, scientists. And it's only by having transparency that we can do that. So that's why transparency is important. The transparency register at the EU, which uh, our organisation was heavily involved in campaigning for, was created in 2011. It's uh, incomplete, it's inconsistent, it's now becoming mandatory, but nevertheless, there are problems with it, as was shown with the case of Philip Morris, which essentially lied on its uh, declaration. And we can, we can see the same with a whole range of other organisations. Here's ILSI, uh, that's its members uh, over there on the far side. And here on this side are the four entries in the register which uh, uh, indicate a membership of ILSI. ILSI itself is not registered, it should be registered. Same is true with EU Pledge, which is a, a CSR attempt to divert attention from the possibility of uh, regulating marketing. Three companies are on the register uh, and instead, in the actuality, 20 food companies are the constituents of EU Pledge not on the register. So, to finish, so corporations have multiple points of access to policy, many more than we realise, many more than policymakers realise. When some of this material has been shown to policymakers at the EU level, they are surprised. They, they say that they didn't know that there were these relationships. Partnership and governance and, governance and self-regulation, if we are to protect public health, need to be replaced with proper regulation, proper public health measures to protect public health uh, from the dangers uh, evident from uh, dangerous products like alcohol, some foods, soft drinks uh, and tobacco. There's a case for managing other industries uh, in the way that the tobacco directive has, has started to manage the tobacco industry, and that is manage them out of the process of policy making, uh, except for in information supply. We need to heighten transparency and enhance conflict of interest rules. Uh, I, I, I learned with some shock when I came here yesterday that the, that the EU is way in advance of the international re regime governing the UN. There's no proper transparency and disclosure here. Uh, and uh, nor is there in the EU, but the EU at least has some measures and there's a process in place. So there's a need to, to properly uh, engage with transparency and enhance conflict of interest, and a need to not just disclose conflicts of interest, but to manage them out so that, that policy making can be, be protected as much as possible from uh, the conflicts which, which will undermine the possibility of public health decisions being taken. Thank you. Thank you, David, very much. I think uh, many of us sitting here in the room, we knew it was bad. We may not have known it was that bad. And I hope what you just presented is also heard by many people outside of this room, because the webs of influence are indeed so difficult to uh, understand and to follow that uh, the work that you have been doing to expose them, I think, is absolutely critical. Are there any questions for clarification in the room at this moment? Yes, please. 
I have a short question about, um, is it a bit the same as in uh, money hiding in shell companies where we try to have different companies <coughs> or dis different associations which are hiding the root uh, of the, the actor who is behind all this? And uh, how can they be uh, unmasked? And um, when they are unmasked, w what happens in the public opinion? And this maybe three steps, or th three questions. It, it is a bit the same. Yes, I mean the, the, these these um, relationships where it's not clear who the funder is, or the extent of the funding, or the extent of the role of funding in the decisions of the organisation, the apparently independent civil society groups. These these are done deliberately. This, the corporations do that deliberately. They have strategy. There are corporations, there are the lobbying and PR companies whose who's pitch to their clients is that we can set these organizations up. So the ex example of EU Pledge there, EU Pledge is a, a badge for 20 co companies supported by the World Federation of Advertisers, but it's run from the offices of Landmark uh, uh, in Brussels, which is a, a lobby firm. And now that's not disclosed either on the Register of Interests. There's no disclosure for, for EU pledge. So yeah, these are deliberate attempts to deceive, not just the public, in fact, not the public, since the public aren't the addressees here. There is attempts to deceive policymakers in Brussels uh, um, uh, about uh, the nature of the influences on, on play. Uh, and it's an attempt also to give a, a, an alibi so that they can say EU pledge is there um, to make sure that these big food companies advertise honestly and they don't advertise the children and they tick all these boxes. Right? And of course, this, this, is a, and this is a technical sociological term. This is a lie, but that's what the, what the aim of it is, to say, we, we are dealing with this, you don't need to regulate us. And that, that EU pledge was very significant. It now seems, if you look at the leaks from Coca-Cola in passing the audiovisual services, the revision of the audiovisual services directorate uh, beginning of this year, I think it was, and Coca-Cola's documents showed that, that, that that was a key element in diverting the commission from taking sensible uh, uh, decisions to restrict advertising to children of, uh, of fast foods and drinks, etc. So yes, they do it deliberately. Um, when it's revealed what happens, well, you, the process for lobbying for the transparency register at the EU level, which we were involved in from the beginning, uh, we've done the same in, in the UK, uh, in Wales, in Scotland, uh, where we've had some success too. Um, it is a long, long process. And they, when they, the register first was mooted, it was a commission thing. It was then taken over. It's a joint commission parliament thing now. Uh, and it's a long process to get something which is usually, and the EU case is the best case in, in Scotland and in the, in the UK. The UK is the worst case. But usually you get something which is rubbish. And you have to then campaign to improve it. And the, the example I'll give you there of Philip Morris, I mean, that was part of the, uh, the process of saying, look, the, this re register is good in principle, but it needs to be better. And that was the, pr the, pr the way in which the register became mandatory. Uh, but even now, it, although it's mandatory, it's becoming mandatory, um, there are all sorts of uh, uh, lacuna in the sense that organizations don't register. The, the, the definition of who should register clearly covers ILSE, for example but they, they're not members. So in, in the case of the EU register, I've used that as one example, but it's the same with uh, transparency and conflict of interest policies for medical journals or social scientific journals. The question is who's going to regulate and police the system? If the corporations are going to lie, which apparently they do, then you need some proper regulation of that. You need not just civil society groups pointing it out, but proper, you know, an, an office which has got the power to investigate and command documents and, and eventually send people to jail. That's that. It's got. You, otherwise, you've got. You know, corporations will just evade the rules. Now, of course, they will always try and evade the rules. But the point of public service, public health regulation, is that you try and close those down to protect public health. So, you know, that's what happens. You, it's an ongoing process of trying to make sure that, that the advances that you have can be properly enforced and, and uh, taken forward. Thank you, David. I'm very conscious of time. So, Alan, if you don't mind leaving the question at the end so that uh, other David also has enough time to present, and then we will simply take a, open the floor to all questions and comments. So, Professor David Klemper.
the yes. button in the middle of the, yeah. Yes. <coughs> Uh, thank you, Lida, and thank you very much, Ipfan, for the invitation. And my task is to bring a somewhat optimistic note into this press conference. I'll do my very best uh, as soon as I found my presentation. Where is it? Should be. And this one as well. And top, just under this yes. one. No, just under, under this one. Yeah. Thank you. So there's no such thing as a free lunch. Um, me, I'm a physician, general intern in medicine, and a professor of, of public health and health sciences. I have no conflict of interest concerning this topic, except for me wanting to have as many people as possible buy the new book which is just being published in June about conflicts of interest and corruption. Uh, as conflicts of interest, uh, the definition, there is one definition of Thompson, which is widespread and which is accepted in Germany. Uh, in the medical profession, I'm talking about the medical pr profession here, uh, circumstances that create a risk that professional judgments or actions regarding a primary interest will be unduly influ influenced by a secondary interest. Three elements, primary interest, secondary interest, and conflict and risk. So a conflict of interest is a risk situation <clears throat> where the, there is a risk that the secondary interest becomes more powerful than the primary interest. And, and the, the pharmaceutical industry knows that and tries to, to implant conflicts of, of interest uh, for example, by inviting us and feeding us, a drug trip says that he was taught the physician is eating with a friend, you are eating with a client. And this kind of friendship and of giving presence uh, is a weapon of influence, friendship, creating friendship, the feeling of friendship, the appearance of friendship is a weapon of influence like reciprocity, which is one of the strongest social rules that we have and which is very functional in most circumstances, but a, a very powerful weapon to make us do things that we would not do for people who are not friendly to us. And the problem of conflicts of interest is that they create bias. We see things that we wouldn't see without the, the conflict of interest, and we know what isn't so. Uh, our vision is blurred, and <clears throat> only few of us here will see parallel lines, but in fact, the, the line is parallel. The lines are parallel. You don't believe? You have to come to the... <laughs> mm. Uh, and the problem with bias is that we do not see that see it. We do not have a sense for for bias. We have a blind spot for bias. Our belief is that our own judgments are less prone to bias than those of others. We see the bias biases in other persons, but not our own. We have the perception of objectivity. We honestly have the perception of of objectivity, uh, and these are automatic cognitive processes beyond our control. So the self-evaluation self of bias leads to a systematic bias. And the only way to prevent this kind of bias is avoiding conflicts of interest wherever possible and averting undue influence. That means, for example, not, not accepting invitations by people who want to influence in an, uh, in an unduly way. Uh, in the German medical profession, there, there has been uh, a growing awareness of the problems. And this, this is an organization, Metzis, Mein Essen zahl ich selbst, I pay for my own lunch. It's an organization of about 1,000 doctors, which is not very much com compared to the 300,000 doctors we have, but it's influential. And the aim is to, to counteract the hug strategy of the pharmaceutical industry. And one more aim is to, to deliver, to, to free 
uh, continual medical education events from the influence of the pharmaceutical industry, which is quite strong right now. And another actor in the, in the German medical profession is the Drug Commission of the German Medical Association. There is an expert committee for transparency and in independence in medicine. I'm a member of that expert com committee, and we have developed rules for independent CME, for example, disclosure of conflicts of interest on a form, uh, and which is more important, no direct or indirect sponsoring of CME events by pharmaceutical or medical device industry. And there are rules for presentation to guarantee objectivity. And speakers on CME events have to be free from conflicts of interest for at least two years. Mm. We don't have to, to go into detail here. Uh, this is an algorithm of the Association of the Scientific Medical Society in Germany, uh, a society of umbrella, umbrella association of 176 medical specialty societies. And this is the, the mechanism, our concept, to minimize the bias of conflicts of interest in the development of guidelines. Guidelines are very important, and it's very important that guidelines, the recommendation of guidelines, are as true as possible, as objective as possible, and the risk of bias has to be minimized, and this is the way we do it, and it's the second version, it's refined, and I think we will reach our goal, it has to be evaluated. But what the, the most important thing is that in the German medical uh, profession, there is a raised and I think now high level of awareness that conflicts of interests are problematic and that they have to be to be prevented, avoided, or if if this is not possible, they have to be managed. And I think that's that's the progress that took place in the last ten years. Another topic is food. We were talking about uh, food TNCs, and there is this NGO, Food Watch, and they collaborate with the German Diabetes Society and with the Berufsverband uh, Kinder- and Jugendärzte with, with the pediatricians. And um, here, here is a letter, an open letter that was signed. You see Eckhard von Hirschhausen by more than 2,000 physicians, uh, a letter which uh, demanded, demand, demands a tax on sugar-sweetened beverages. And this letter and this initiative uh, is supported by Eckhard von Hirschhausen, whom you may not know, but he's a physician and he's a comedian very well known, and his messages reach millions of people by television. That's an asset. Uh, and one more example is the German Medical Association, which just last week uh, published demands concerning sugar in beverages and in food, and food labeling uh, demands to, to change the food environment, political demands for government regulations, so that tax food labeling. And I think that's these were very, very good demands, which were accepted by by the annual meeting of the German Medical Association. Only a short look at which interests have non-state actors and very different non-state actors uh, <coughs> are listed under this in the same category, public interest, NGOs, and private sector entities. And Margaret Chan, I, I think she said it all. She said it all in 2013 on the 8th Global Conference on Health Promotion. Uh, I cite efforts to prevent non-communicable diseases go against the business interests of powerful economic operators. It's not just big tobacco anymore. Public health must also contend with big food, big soda, and big alcohol. All of these industries fear regulation and protect themselves by using the same tactics. They include front groups, lobbies, promises of self-regulation, lawsuits, and industry-funded research that confuses the evidence and keeps the public in doubt. 
They include arguments that place the responsibilities for harm to health on individuals and portray government actions as interference in personal liberties and free choice. This is formidable opposition. Market power readily translates, in, translates into political power. Few governments prioritize health over big business. As we learned from experience with the tobacco industry, a powerful corporation can sell the public just about anything. I think this is what the two speakers before me uh, already explained. And this, for me, is the truth. Uh, Non-state actors like <coughs> our public interest NGOs and private sectors entities and their interests are incompatible. Public interest NGOs, uh, their primary interest is health for all. The fiduciary obligation is the public good. And private sector entities like food TNCs, their primary interest is making profits by selling food pro products, which is legitimate, of course. And their fiduciary obligations are the shareholders, the interests of the shareholders. And that's also legitimate. But in the, the, the interests are incompatible, incompatible, like the interests of the fox and the hen in this situation. Uh, and a few words about how food TNCs pursue their goals. Uh, David Miller said it all, but I want to, to give you only one, one or one and a half examples. Uh, the food TNCs fund research in their own interests. And I learned, I learned about the web of influence that they knit and they shape published opinions and they use the tactics of denialism. And Coca-Cola, the Coca-Cola company, uh, has a mission to refresh the world, to inspire moments of optimism and happi happiness. And they just recently gave us a fresh look into a fresh impression of how they think. Uh, a very concrete example. Uh, a document was leaked about an, an event that was already known. Science organizations and Coca-Cola's war with the public health community, insights from an internal industry document. And this is the global energy balance network that Coca-Cola wanted to, to create, an independent research organization with the mission of reframing obesity as a problem of energy balance, not of, of consuming sugar-sweetened beverages. That's not a problem, it's the energy balance. And they had a plan to influence everybody who is important, policymakers, healthcare professionals, and so on, a very detailed plan to influence them. And they <coughs> portrait, wanted to portray GBN, GEBN as an honest broker in the obesity debate, uh, an institution for journalists, the first address. And they wanted, of course, distract from effective solutions. They wanted to combat science with science. And they wanted to promote obesity reduction strategies that are commensurate with Coca-Cola's interest. Very open and refreshing words that Coca-Cola used in an internal document. And this, I think, this is important, and I, I stress this, uh, this sentence. They saw the GEBN as a weapon in the growing war between the public health community and private industry over obesity. So they see themselves in war with the public health community, in war, 2014. And uh, the science of, of obesity prevention, the science is pretty clear. Uh, the res responsibilities for action, uh, if, if you found uh, initiatives, uh, policies on personal responsibilities, it's less effective on collective responsibilities is more effective. If the actions on type of explanation for consumption of unhealthy foods are supply to type solutions, it's more effective. It's demand type solutions, it's less effective. Government regulation is more in fact effective and industries, industry self-regulation is less effective. That's clear, that's the science of, of obesity prevention. And you only have to put the question, which actors follow the science and which actors deny it. So my key message is conflicts of interest. The problem is bias of judgment and actions and the blind, bias blind spot. 
the interests of public health and food tendencies are incompatible, uh, antagonistic, and concerning WHO and food tendencies, the WHO should avert any influence of the industry. There should be no participation at all in the decision making of those who call themselves enemies of the of the public health community. And I think this is a clear message. Hopefully the WHO follows these recommendations next week. David, thank you very much. Again, just now a question for clarification to David, if there is any. Otherwise, then we will open floor for discussion uh, with regard to all three presentations. Yes, Robert James. Robert James Parsons, journalist. Just a point with regard to energy balance. Um, I believe Coca-Cola has found for themselves here a superb argument because energy balance is very important. We exercise entirely too little. We're too sedentary. But at the same time, that has nothing to do with incorporating sugar into your diet on a regular and abundant basis. But they're focused on a very real problem. And the and again, I think it's, a go it's turning out to be a goldmine for them because it's enabling them to sh shunt aside completely the sugar that is constantly being uh, being channeled into our diets and the completely deleterious effects that it has and but but again to me it's just an example of latching on to a very valid principle to the exclusion of others that are just as valid or even more important Thank you very much. So, David, if you would not mind taking your seat, and we will now open a discussion to all three presentations. Just a quick reminder, Judith has given us a, a sense of doom in a, in a way that she says, the biggest obstacles we are facing are political obstacles. We are uh, seeing the concept of conflicts of interest used as a alibi for actually fueling processes that have nothing to do with adequate, appropriate safeguards. So we are seeing people engaged in pseudo consultations when people pick and choose afterwards which of the comments and suggestions are taken on board. And those that are uncomfortable are simply left out. And what we do see is also a blurring of what we normally would consider legally acceptable traditional concept of conflicts of interest. Therefore, if somebody says conflicts of interest, they may mean something very different from what we are talking about here. David Miller, he took us primarily to the European level, which is very important because we see at the level of the World Health Assembly that the European Union very often as a bloc is blocking whatever uh, suggestions there are to return WHO back on the path of fulfilling its mandate and its constitutional functions. And what WHO should be doing, that means protecting the space that allows it to do uh, those kind of functions from undue influences, particularly from undue influences that come from the corporate sector. And David Klemper gave us a little bit of hope. He showed us that people, if they are made aware, at least some of them, start taking action, taking action from themselves, realizing that conflict of interest is not something that sits somewhere in the middle of the room but that it's inherent in them, in their minds, or in their organizations, and that they are able to move ahead in building certain level of safeguards. 
Uh, it was a cautious optimism because from everything that we have heard and seen around us, uh, we do not have much uh, to be looking forward to in terms of the upcoming World Health Assembly or generally in terms of what is happening now in the public health arena in particular because that's what we are talking about here. So that was my attempt to somehow highlight what we heard in these presentations and now I'm opening the floor to the discussion. And first I would call on Alan because he was patient with me and held his question until now. Thank you, Lita. I just wanted to ask David Miller whether he'd given any attention to Geneva in terms of the intricate um, set of organizations that are based here um, in terms of the influence that they have. I mean, us who live here know about some of these because we witness them. We even get invitations to participate. So, you know, it's there. But um, I, I'm not aware that anybody has done a proper study of the way in which the different, um, and mainly pharmaceutical companies, but there are others are involved as well. Um, so I, first of all, you know, has he had a chance to look at that? Um, or does he believe the sort of toolkit that he's developed um, when he's been looking at the influence of companies um, through the various trade associations and, you know, organizations which they set up as, as so-called NGOs? Does his work, could his work on that be easily adapted to looking at the situation here in Geneva? My question goes, I think to all of you, it's about WHO. I think we know the problem. We know the failure of WHO to properly address conflicts of interest. The question is, what would you ask WHO? How can they do better? I think what would be positive steps to really address the power of of the of the economic interests and uh, to protect the normative and the regulatory work of the World Health Organization? In particular, is there can this framework on engagement with non-state actors can this be made better? Can this be repaired? There will be a uh, formal uh, review evaluation of this framework next year. Uh, what will you feed into this process? Will you tell them stop this because it's it does just does not work, or do you think that there are elements which could be improved in order to have a better framework of WHO engagement, in particular with the private sector? Thank you. Thank you, Thomas, very much. Uh, um, I forgot to mention when you are taking the floor, please say where you come from so that those who are not with us in the room can. Uh, it's Medicus Mundi International. We have been part of a group of organizations having watched and critically followed the uh, development and implementation of this framework on engagement of the WHO. Thank you very much, Thomas. Gopa. Uh, to speak on the microphone so that it goes into the broadcast. So I'm uh, Gopakumar. I work with the Third World Network. Um, my question is uh, to Professor uh, Miller. Uh, many of these networks and the organization, is it the sometimes, uh, of course, to fix the policy or uh, tilt the policy towards them, but is it also to maintain the status quo at, by and large, uh, which ki currently favors them? Uh, like I'm taking the case of like NCD, like if you look at uh, many times, uh, you don't find any active articulation from the WHO or all these uh, uh, co commissions or committees formed with the uh, industry participation, which never articulate uh, or recommend uh, to take actions against like uh, sugar or food and beverages companies. Or I'm basically asking, is it only to f tilt the policies in their favor or, or also to maintain a status quo which favors them? Thank you very much. So these were the first three questions. So I will ask the panelists to respond. Maybe David, if you start. 
Thanks. So on Geneva, no, I haven't. Uh, I'm, I remember when the scales first fell from my eyes about the European Union, which was on a cold January morning in 2002 when I went on a walking tour with Corporate Europe Observatory around Brussels and I was like, oh, that's how it works. And that was part of the experience of getting me into doing work at the European level as well as doing work in, in the, the uh, UK. And I, of course, I met Judith before a long time ago and read her work, but it's when you come here and people talk to you and you see how things work that you start to understand. And I've only been here a few hours, but I feel I'm starting to get a little bit of understanding. <laughs> and so I, I, I haven't done anything, no, but I'm, I'm very keen on developing this. I think my, the account I've, I've got in the last day or so suggests that things here are a lot worse than they are at the EU level, which I was surprised at. I thought the EU was bad. Uh, so yes, I'm very interested. Could the the, um, the research toolkit that we use be adapted here? Yes, of course. It depends. Uh, I mean, the second level of research is investigations. You investigate. You do FOIs. You do access to documents. You go on the web. You find corporate uh, documents, etc. But the first level it depends on publicly accessible sources of data. So I, d I don't know if there is a trade association directory here. Maybe there is, but there isn't. Uh, a transparency register. I don't think there's a register of, of experts, maybe there is, but th those kinds of data need to be there in order to be able to crunch something to start to see the networks. But, um, you know, the, the, the methods could be used. On the question of um, do they just lobby for change or do they also lobby for the status quo? Yes, of course they do both and uh, they, they lobby to sabotage the possibility of change. Yes, of course, it depends what's in their interests and they kick things into the long grass, they try and divert attention. They have a, you know, they have a repertoire, as you know, of techniques and which they employ to make sure that uh, significant progress will not be made. And that, that involves you know, not just um, uh, stopping decision makers from taking proper decisions by buying them off, offering them jobs, by lobbying them, etc., but also by attempting to corrupt uh, civil society, not just through creating fake grassroots groups, but by trying to co-opt the left of civil society. And we, we see that process happening all the time, don't we? So th those, there's a whole range of tactics, tactics and techniques. We know of people who've gone from Friends of the Earth or from Oxfam in, into the corporate offices and uh, then used the, what their knowledge of civil society to, ta to attack civil society. One of my favorite examples is the example of, uh, his name escapes me now, the uh, former labor researcher in the European Parliament who uh, fell out with a drug company and went to work for Oxfam for several months and then went back to a lobby company and told them everything that he knew about what Oxfam was up to. Yeah. Thank you, David. Uh, I think the revolving door is something, again, that would be for almost another conference Sorry. and speaking. I, I should say I remember his name. David Earnshaw. Go and look him up. You, know, you may know him. <laughs> Burson Marstella he works for now. <laughs> Thank you. Revolving door, for example, would be another major subject for this type of a discussion. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, we don't have that much time. But I would now like to ask Judith if you could reflect on the questions. And perhaps uh, what was already voiced um, initially also by David in his presentation. Uh, are these webs so complicated that nobody really understands? And that's why our, our governments are failing us. Because we say WHO didn't do this and WHO didn't do that. But on the other hand, it's the member states that should be guiding WHO in a certain direction. So is it just too complicated for the policymakers to understand? Or is it because some of them are not doing their job? Uh, maybe I take the broad question and, and link it to FENSA. Uh, you have to switch. Yes, okay. I take the broad uh, question and link it to FENSA and what happens at the WHO level. I know that now a lot of people pay attention to corporate capture of various processes, but I for quite some time now have tried to say, look also at co-optation and unwitting or knowing collaboration. And this is where I think is now a very big problem, because if you look at what happens at the UN level since the partnership paradigm came up, there is the so-called 
principle of inclusiveness, which went into FENSA, this has to go out immediately if it's to be applied to all non-state actors. The principle of inclusiveness was meant in the old days to ensure that not some well-funded NGOs would talk in this at uh, for uh, social movements or that there would be really a, a good representation of civil society voices. And now it's being used, I call it selective inclusiveness. It's used to have all the stakeholders, but the stakeholders, a stakeholder right now stands for transnational cooperation. What is called multi-stakeholder means corporations have to be in the process. Principle of inclusiveness has to go from FENSA when it is being revised. Personally, I do think that FENSA and the discussions about FENSAs have certainly brought out quite a number of problems. And it would be good, actually, while we are here being very critical of WHO, to say, what about the rest of the UN? So um, what has been found already, and I do know, for example, Gopa and others have worked very hard on the four policies for the four actors. It's important to look at the overall framework at the beginning, which is very problematic. Uh, and there, as I said, out with inclusiveness, but in Sun, which is pretending it has the authority to teach our governments how to deal with conflicts of interest, they still they say we are a movement because when Sun is coming to a country, suddenly all the nutrition professionals and civil servants are meant to be part of a movement. And if you look at the website, it says they subscribe to principles. And in these principles, which are multi-stakeholder principles, public making public private uh, hybridization in nutrition is the principle of trust. Of course, this has to go, and it's good. In FENSA, it went. It was there at the beginning. There is no more principle of trust, but if you look at conflict of interest legislation, you have to put in the principle of vigilance, and of course, particular vigilance when it comes to interacting with corporations that have an interest in influencing, but unfortunately, also vigilance for any public interest and professional association because conflicts of interest is about whether they are conflicted. So uh, David um, Klemperer did put out this wonderful quote by Dr. Chan and people were so hopeful when she made this presentation. And the next thing is during the FENSA process, member states in 2014 wanted a lot of answers and really took uh, the initiative to say, you have to work on conflicts of interest. And if you look historically, this is when the whole move towards stakeholderization in the obesity arena started under Dr. Chan, saying it's good to have all partners together. And we are now going towards the UN conference in March and uh, in uh, autumn and look at the composition of those who prepare. It's not even anymore about conflicts of interest. We know there was a civil society alliance being selected. We know that the civil society alliance said, yes, we take pharmaceutical company money and yes, we couldn't even uh, be there without that money. But if civil so other civil society groups bring this up as a problem, nothing happens. We also know, I would uh, like, I think people have not looked enough, but uh, academic experts, if an academic so-called expert has at the same time a consultancy and you see in the clients pharmaceutical companies, if this were about guidelines on medicines used, this person would not be acceptable. But here it's acceptable for world health policies. And the last uh, point about how WHO is right now preparing and actually shaping this uh, commission is industry is invited straight at the table. The World Economic Forum is an official member 
So what we are seeing, and I haven't put the word into my presentation, in 2010, the World Economic Forum, which has all the major companies of this world, said the UN is not really doing a good job. So we will have here now something called Global Redesign Initiative. And if the UN isn't doing something well, then we may just have alliances of the willing and the able who will take the issue into their hands. And WHO and other UN agencies should become part of this, what is called global stakeholder governance. It means a corporate-led governance, or otherwise they just are redundant and are being defunded. And we see the same in civil society. If you take the shepherd image, I hadn't the time to ask the usual, is there something missing? The watchdogs are missing. The watchdogs have been, uh, there is no more funding for critical groups. There is no funding for critical research. There is, a, while it has been made acceptable to take funding from venture philanthropy. So venture philanthropy says they have a philosophy to bring business thinking into our public institutions. This is a question for people who do theories on conflicts of interest. At the FENSA, there was a debate. Uh, private sector is not allowed to second people, but Germany prevented the same for venture philanthropies. There has been a big debate to not allow secondment by venture philanthropies because during the whole reform under Dr. Chan, it came out that Ted Turner's UN Foundation had somebody very high up and if you look at what is happening now, we have a creation of a so-called movement. And who is coordinating a lot of this? The Ted Turner's UN Foundation, while member states said, no, we couldn't eliminate this uh, secondment from venture philanthropies, but they shouldn't be in sensitive positions. So that would be something that could be done very quickly with Svensson. Let's see whether we have some more uh, questions. Uh, uh, we can go very broadly. We can also focus very specifically at the World Health Assembly issues. Uh, I see Bob, uh, Thomas, no, uh, Gopa and Robert James. No? Please use the mic. Okay. My name is Robert Peck. I, I'm a member of the board of the IP, uh, IPFAN in Geneva, Geneva office. Um, my question is, for example, uh, next week, what is the optic, uh, well, the goal? Is it to say that uh, private financial partnerships are to be excluded altogether, or is it to work for regulation of the financial partnerships that exist, even at the university levels, that we see this uh, as a constant problem. Chairs and research is funded, and many, uh, the EPFL, for example, here in Lausanne, uh, accepts that this is something that we need because the governments cannot afford the programs to move ahead. Governments are not able to, to, uh, to provide the, the money necessary. So the question is, at the level that we're talking about today, is it possible to go on without private funding? And is that, is that, is that, the, is, is, is that a, an acceptable uh, possibility? Or is it next week we say, to the World Health Organization, no, this is not possible. We don't accept the, f the idea of funding because we don't think we can regulate it. Or do we say we do accept the funding as a necessity, but we need to regulate it? That's my, basically my question. <laughs> Thank you very much. 
I guess um, uh, like to uh, flag two issues related to this NCD. Um, you know, there is an NCD working uh, working group on civil society. So I happened to look at this a few days ago. Uh, all the members, I don't find any civil society. It is chaired by NCD Alliance. Then you have all the professional associations like World Heart Association, Diabetic Association. So you don't find really, uh, and WHO now, you know, civil society for WHO be, uh, set a president now saying that uh, these are all part of the civil society. And uh, also uh, any engagement with any kind of uh, non-state actors is supposed to be part of the uh, in in non-state actors register and you don't find any information about uh, even NCD alliance there and second is a particular recommendation about uh, uh, about the independent commission on NCD again appointed by the DG uh, so basically they looked at the all the factors and they looked at two reports the DG reports uh, sorry the secretary general's report to the UN General Assembly and also the secretary report prepared by for the World Health Assembly and then the idea of the Commission is to come out with a very focused recommendation so basically one of the recommendations on NCD is to universalize uh, uh, HPV vaccination uh, and one of the criteria rational for uh, such a recommend uh, all the recommendations are the scaling up possibilities uh, free from conflict of interest etc uh, but what we found maybe i am not challenging the efficacy of the vaccine but the cost part and there are only two com two companies who produces hpv vaccine and uh, of course the uh, world economic forum is part of the uh, Forum is part of the uh, this independent commission, and one of the partners of World Economic Forum is actually Glaxo, one of the manufacturers of this vaccine. So can it be considered as a conflict of interests? But vaccine efficacy and all, I am not getting into it. It might be useful also, but uh, you know there is some kind of what I would say that perceived conflict of interest. Is it is it a correct way of reasoning it? That's what. I Thank you, Robert James. Thank you. First of all, <coughs> with regard to what Robert Peck said about regulating funding, the problem there is simply the preponderant power, monetary and the general power of industry to interfere in any regulation. And that brings me to a point I just came upon a long time ago, and that is a mentality and it's rarely discussed but a person who studies and then seeks out a job in the corporate sector and spends a great deal of his or her life in the corporate sector acquires a corporate mentality and that person can be removed from the corporate sector for years but that person's then going to work in the public sector still has the corporate mentality and perceives everything from that point of view i've never seen an exception on the other hand, I've seen an exception where it works the other way. A person working in public health, and I can name the person, David Navarro, who is doing interesting work at WHO, is now working for Sun, and he's defending industry. So you can have the you can have the shift toward public a, a private interest mentality from a public interest one, but I've never seen it work the other way. What I I'm I've been wrangling with WHO since nineteen. 96 when I first started working with Nancy Jo Peck on Nestle I've been declared persona non grata by Nestle and even denounced in the British Medical Journal by Nestle but anyway I'm on to uh, electromagnetic radiation now in WHO the norms of WHO were set by a Dr. Michael Repicholi who had as his mandate to raise some funds in order to pay for the program. It turned out that the program was paid entirely by the telecommunications industry. There was an uproar over this, and an international petition was launched, and he was forced out of WHO. You might keep that in mind as a little glimmer of hope that it's possible to do something. He's living in Tuscany now. He has a fabulous villa down there, and he still gives conference presentations. But anyway, the basic norms were set by WHO in 
coordination with the United States Air Force. And in March, the Swiss Senate refused permission for the industry to raise its output on relay antennas for cell phones. This was declared by industry as the beginning of the end of Switzerland as a developed country, uh, by the way. But the point that's very crucial here is that the reason the Senate refused it is that the Swiss Medical Association lobbied against it. It was the FMH, Fédération des Médecins Helvétiques, that lobbied vigorously against it and had it defeated on public health grounds. And uh, Switzerland is no small player in this because of its reputation. So there are little glimmers of hope here, whatever. But anyway, as for, uh, going back to the pingo-bingo conflict, anything that can let industry have a say, such as formulating regulations, is to be avoided, in my opinion, because industry will come on like a, a Mack truck and, you know, there's no way around them. You've got to somehow work around them independently. And it's less and less easy because there's less and less funding for the public interest uh, NGOs. But I don't see any hope as soon as industry gets in. Thank you, Robert James. You have given us uh, additional examples. Uh, but uh, let's uh, make sure that we give enough uh, space to the panel here so that they can respond and reflect still on what they were saying. So can we now come to the questions that we received from the floor? Who will start, David? I would like to make I would like to relate to a question that you asked before the last round of questions, and it's about what can we do next week, World Health Assembly. I do not have a solution. I do not have an answer. But uh, what I was thinking is uh, that in Germany we have made progress in the in the in the question of of conflicts of interest in the health profession it has to do with physicians being part of a profession. And this profession has a kind of identity. And this identity has to do with pride. And it has to do with high ethical standards. And we know that we don't, do not always live up to, to the high ethical standards. And there is a gap sometimes. And I think the progress that we made in Germany was that we offered physicians to close that gap, at least to make it more narrow. Uh, because most physicians are motivated to, to be good physicians and to act on, on the interests of their, of their patients and to, to fulfill their fiduciary role towards the, the patients. I think it's, it has to do with identity. And when I look at WHO, I'm, I'm not a specialist. I have no deep knowledge of the WHO. But my impression is that the WHO might have had a public health identity what Margaret Chan said, the quote that, that I gave you, points to what the points to what the direction that that this is public health identity, but this identity somehow got lost, and this is why we are talking about partnerships of all kinds, uh, which in essence give the industry the possibility to influence. The, the WHO in a way that is not public health anymore. Identity, it has to do, to do with identity. I do not know how to safeguard or restore the identity of the WHO, but this, this is something that would have to be done to, to have a better WHO. Thank you, David, very much. I think what we may need to understand Uh, I think what we may want to emphasize here, WHO has its constitution, it has its mandate, it has its constitutional functions. The trouble is that there is a major deviation from what actually is, uh, if you use the language of fiduciary duty of WHO to do. So uh, it would not be so 
problematic in a way uh, because the the goal is there where we are going is clear it should be you know fulfilled but what we are seeing is the constant deviation and it's taking almost a u-turn from the uh, original constitutional uh, duties so just to add to to what you were saying you know the the what what where we should be we know but uh, where we are and why we are there is not always correctly analyzed. And therefore, the strategies to, again, shift the process, I think, are not mm. necessarily clear. And uh, Thomas, if you allow me, you know, I'm abusing now my moderator's role, but uh, you said, can we use FENSA? Can it still be uh, improved? And uh, I don't know. But I do think there is an opportunity because of the upcoming 2019 review of FENSA. Now, the key is, how is this review going to be done? Will it be independent, truly independent? Not just what Gopa was saying a moment ago, that there is a commission that calls itself independent and yet has the World, Food, uh, World Economic Forum sitting on it. So it's again an abusive use of words that mean something and they are now used in a very different context. So yes, if FENSA's review is done independently, transparently by the right people, it will most likely, we know, show that it does not work in the form it is. But can we expect that is another question. But I will now shut up and please, floor is yours. So to respond to the question about strategy, uh, I mean, obviously, groups have to decide what they want, how they want to play their strategy. I mean, it seems to me, from the point of view of a, being a, a part of a small non-profit organisation which is engaged in campaigning for greater transparency, no doubt there are many things we'd like to see down the road after we've got the transparency, but we have to start where we are, I think. Uh, so we might, want, we might argue that the corporations should be removed from the process. I did argue that. But you know, obviously the, you also want to reform the system to make it better, to make it more easy for us to reform it further. And transparency is a, is a place to start with that. When people talk about the, the question of um, uh, making, you mean, regulating the way in which the money operates. Well, the, the, this non-state actors register, I just went on the non-state actors register. I, I don't know if this is correct, but it doesn't seem to be public. You've got to sign in to get access to who the non-state actors are. That, I mean, very incremental demand, make it public and make it pr a proper register with proper disclosure of, of funding sources and memberships and all that kind of thing. You, use, the, use the format of the U European Commission and Parliament's register, which it, at least in its rules is, is reasonable as, as, a, as a starting point. And that you start to stay, see a lot more then about who the NCD Alliance is, who funds it, who, who, are, memberships, who are members of it, how much they pay, what, what the, the governance structure is, all of that kind of thing is, is, is essential and of course is you know, mild reforms, takes ages, uh, isn't very worthwhile, but gets you somewhere. Okay, Judith, please. Um, and I want to just uh, make it clear re regarding time. Our colleagues here were really nice to us. We should have already finished a long time ago, but we are still giving some, uh, how many minutes can we still have? We can go for one round, I think, no problem. For one more round. round Excellent. Well, I may just jump at the word transparency. I think it's in FENSA, I'm not totally sure, but it certainly is in the OECD guidelines for managing conflict of interest in the public service, which are from 2003. And we have said for a long time that, of course, member states which are also part of the OECD, how come that in FENSA they don't seem to have the same kind of criteria that they are meant to have by OECD? For example, uh, public officials should observe the following core principles, serving the public interest, so this is the constitutional mandate and functions, Promoting individual responsibilities and personal example, especially if you are a high-level official. Engendering an organizational culture which is intolerant of conflicts of interest. And supporting transparency and public scrutiny. 
So I would like to bring up actually according, if I uh, remember well, the UN guidelines on cooperation or collaboration with uh, the private sector do say that all the multi-stakeholder partnerships or public-private partnerships should be on the web. And while we have this whole SDG saying multi-stakeholder partnerships are the tool and promise actually that they will be on the web, we don't have them. WHO's, if you go, it has a partnership policy which we were told is not observed because it's too expensive. So we also should maybe discuss that, what we, during the reform, we learned things that were there were not observed, and we are observing it with FENSA right now. There are things that are not observed. So I think for this World Health Assembly, if we could have all the interactions similar to the 2014 list before the World Health Assembly, it would already increase the transparency. This is what we have in pharmaceuticals. The companies say the medicine is the best for cancer, but they don't give the data to judge it. But WHUN has actually said it would do this. Now, a con transparency, uh, we have the word transparency, but when you look at the rules of WHO for experts, they have been changed, and they strangely have a gag rule. You, I don't know, but I think it's still there. In the 2015 technical discussion on conflicts of interest in nutrition, we said, lift the gag rule. You have to sign that you will not talk about what you said in the expert meeting. I think WHO is very much confusing protection of inside knowledge with uh, some strange protection of maybe not correct processes. So the gag rule should go. And the last, uh, Bob, that is to answer to you, you come from a university and from, uh, but I think what we have been discussing in, at WHO level, there we also had a message of hope from civil society. We said if WHO does define institutional conflicts of interest correctly, we would help, we would help to a campaign for lifting the freeze on uh, government contributions to UN agencies because it's not that expensive. A New York Times article pointed out that financing WHO core functions is half of the price of the New York Presbyterian Hospital. How much public money are we wasting by, due to this now current trend towards getting funding even from corporations that create public health problems, we are not regulating marketing of obesity, creating snacks and sodas. Where is this calculation? There has also been a calculation, calculations about the price of venture philanthropy. So if we talk about partnerships, of course, Anwes said, well, you could maybe talk about this differently. Companies can refrain from undue marketing. We know that in reality, it's difficult for them. But uh, venture philanthropy, how can we build on a system which makes some people richer and richer? and not look that, for example, one document shows that Microsoft is actively lobbying against revision of tax laws that you can have a better public, uh, public uh, funding for what we have to do. So I think the calculations have to be done differently. And the type of uh, public-private finance, which you pointed out, I would call it public-private venture get the partnership out of it, and then you look where you where it's useful, where it's not useful. But WHO should be fully funded with public money. Thank you very much, Judith. So now, would you like to, all three of you, share with us sort of your words of wisdom are there any, is there anything that you would like people here and 
outside who are hearing us to take sort of uh, away from this discussion. We heard lots of bad news. We heard a little, little bit of good news. Is there something that you would like as a key message that everybody hears after having heard now our discussion and remembers it, not only for today, but for many more years to come? Okay, so I've only got one thing, which is, what, which is to say that um, the, the process of lobbying and campaigning for the European Transparency Register, and indeed for lobbying transparency regulations in Wales, Scotland and the UK, uh, was one which um, required civil society groups to come together to, to, to explicitly campaign on that basis. So we formed the Alliance for Lobbying Transparency and Ethics Regulation in the EU, Alter EU, and we formed the Alliance for Lobbying Transparency in the UK and the Alliance for Lobbying Transparency in Scotland. Uh, and those were um, civil society groups including um, development NGOs, green NGOs, uh, media, journalism type NGOs and trade unions. And I think that may maybe that's a, a possibility. Maybe you think about a campaign for pushing the institutions, WHO, for greater transparency and uh, opening up uh, who, who are all these NGOs, alleged NGOs and civil society groups. But let, let's have a campaign for that. Oh, yes, briefly. <laughs> it's maybe because of the history of my country. I grew up post Second World War. And uh, so I'm not only looking at the nasty actors out there, I'm looking at where may we have become unwittingly or maybe knowingly part of the problem. So my words of wisdom would be, even if we have become part of the problem, let's have the civil courage to change that and become part of the solution. And for that, I think what we need, stop looking at so-called civil society, which is actually, there is now a lot of top-down building. I read that Sun was created based on a paper written by two people. So what I would like to say, remember the ethics of your pro profession, remember the mandate of your public institution, build on that and join across from UN civil servants to parliamentarians, to people in universities, to people wherever they are, including students, and use just common sense when you think something sounds very strange. Thank you, Judith. David. Uh. You are asked for wisdom. I'm asked for wisdom. Well, uh, I have problems with being wise. Uh, but mm, what my wish is <clears throat> that the WHO uh, focuses its activities on its core functions to protect the health of the public. And that's a so humane task and it should not be distracted in any way by interests, interests which are not compatible with this core functions. That's a wish. And I don't know if it's wise or not, but it's <laughs> what I would like to, to see. Thank you very much. I think there are many here and out there who have the same wish and who would very much like to see WHO uh, going in that direction. Uh, it is my uh, pleasure to thank the three panelists. I think I do believe that we have brought together a mixture of knowledge and experience that enrich discussions that we usually have before the World Health Assembly, that brought in also very strongly the EU, which we know is now a body causing lots of problems in various processes, be it in WHO or, as my colleague Alessia could uh, say, also in a process that the Human Rights Council is engaged in, in trying to build a treaty on business and human rights. We as IPFAN have been very much for decades trying to 
hold corporations accountable. And we're trying also to make sure that the governments are doing their job and that they translate what the UN comes up with in terms of rules for uh, the business, in this case, baby food companies, that the governments are taking it seriously and are implementing it nationally. So in a way, let me give now the last word to my colleague, Alessia, because she has an announcement to make on behalf of the network that organized this meeting. Thank you. So the small announcement is about the release this year of the new State of the Code by Country, which is a, a publication made by our technical office in Malaysia. This is the old version, 2016. Um, about the implementation of the International Code of Marketing of Breast Milk Substitutes worldwide. Uh, there, will be, there will be an official launch of this document, but I t brought today a press release with the contact information and please uh, oops, get a copy at the end of the room. And thank you for your attention again. Thank you for thank you all the speakers for, the, for your presentation. Thank you, Lida, for moderating this press conference today. And thank you. <laughs> and we thank very much the Club Suisse de la Presse because it's always wonderful to work with you uh, and to make this event possible. It's thanks to you. Thank you all very much for being here. And <laughs> and then please, uh, we have little refreshments at the back of the room, so help yourself.